The third Nancy Drew game is Message in a Haunted Mansion. This is the first game that was sold at retail, and it's the oldest Nancy Drew game which is still available for purchase, since the first two were discontinued. The premise of the game is that Nancy is helping Rose Green renovate a house in San Francisco. Rose needs the help because there have been a series of mysterious accidents. Get used to that storyline because it will appear a lot in the series after this game. We start in Nancy's room, which is the Chinese room. It's stylistically interesting. All the rooms in this game are interesting and look nice, except maybe the bland hallways. I like the scenery in this game. It's fantastic and atmospheric. I especially like the variety when it comes to the scenery. They easily could have made all the rooms look the same because the game takes place inside just one building, but they took the extra effort to make each room unique. I like it, and I think it's more successful here than in, say, Nancy Drew, The Deadly Device, where all the rooms have a generic science theme, and even though they're different, they're all mostly the same. Whereas this game, you have a saloon and a library and the two upstairs bedrooms, which are neat, and that really mixes things up. You start by talking to everyone and exploring the house. Uh, the first character you meet is Abby, who tries to convince Nancy that the house is haunted. Abby is my favorite character in this game. She projects a mysterious aura, which makes her intriguing, and she's funny. She always seems to have something interesting to say. Until you go through like her five conversation topics, then she ignores you forever. Reminds me of some people I know in real life. Abby and Rose are the co-owners of the house, but Abby is more of a suspect while Rose is a victim. I like Rose, but she's kind of stressed out and snappy for the entire game. I don't like her character design. Her animation is freaky. She keeps bobbing her head to the side in an unnatural way, which is distracting. She's sitting at a strange angle, which I guess is an attempt to hide the fact that she and Charlie are identical from the waist down, but I thought it was a weird way to sit. And then there's a conversation with Hannah uh, about how Rose looks. Hannah says Rose looks about 20 years younger than she is, but no, Rose looks over 50. She does not look under 40. So, maybe Rose doesn't look the way she's supposed to. Fine, it's not that distracting. I still think they should have tweaked her a bit. Make her head less wobbly, and you're good to go. Uh, you know, that way reviewers like me won't be complaining about Rose for minutes in their, their super long reviews. Rose gives Nancy three jobs to do. The first one is a tile puzzle, which is a bad puzzle that I don't like. It is so bad, and people had so much trouble with it, that her interactive released a patch for the game, which lets players skip over the puzzle entirely. It's a tangram puzzle, where you have to make a phoenix. You need to put nine pieces into place, and it's difficult, because it is a, per a pixel-perfect challenge. If you're just a little bit off for any of the pieces, it doesn't count. Which stinks, because you can have a piece which looks like it's in the perfect spot, but it's not, and you have to move it again. Frustrating. Another problem with the puzzle? Both wings are the exact same size and shape, but the upper wing must have the square, while the bottom wing must have the parallelogram. You cannot switch to two wings, even though the pieces should technically fit the same way in both wings. They're the same size. So, bad puzzle right at the start of the game. Not a good sign. Rose's next job is a, a second tile puzzle. You need to find a paint scraper and use it to scrape away some of the tiles on the second floor. The paint scraper is near some paint supplies in the main hallway, which is good. It's logical. It makes sense for a painting tool to be with the painting supplies. When Nancy uses the paint scraper to scrape away the tiles, she finds a hidden attic. It's locked with a key. The key is in a cash register in the basement. Not good, not logical, and not great. It doesn't make sense. I imagine a lot of players got stuck on that puzzle. And the, and the game clearly doesn't intend for players to explore the attic right away because the key is behind Charlie. Charlie being the third character of the game inside the basement saloon, as I said earlier, this location stands out because it's unexpected and different from the rest of the game. I'm a little indifferent towards Charlie, but most players like him because he's a cute young guy who does all of the housework. Well, what's not to like? Well, maybe his wrinkly shirt. He should get that shirt ironed. 
Charlie's actually two characters from the book morph together. Charlie in the book is a grumpy old guy who's who serves as Lewis's henchman. He's also Tim, uh, the young blonde guy who's secretly living in the basement and who steals cake without permission. I thought it was a good idea to make Charlie into the younger character because not only does the game target audience like it, but having two different old men in this game would be pushing it. Charlie doesn't contribute much to the first half of the game. He mostly says he has no idea what's causing the accidents, and he says he's not responsible. After you talk to the first three characters, Lewis appears in the study, and that's not obvious uh, the game is set up that way, because the game starts at 8 o'clock, and Lewis doesn't appear until 12 o'clock. Let me talk about the time for a bit. Uh, the previous game had two times, daytime and nighttime. This game has a full 24 hours. You, you, you use the alarm clock in Nancy's room to reach a specific time. The time doesn't affect the scenery or anything like that. Everywhere looks the same, whether it's 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. All the characters are around during the 12 to 3 o'clock time. After that, some of the characters leave. The time matters because you can only explore Abby's room and Charlie's basement when those characters aren't there. It's a neat feature and it's realistic, but practically speaking, they could have just reused the time system from the previous game with daytime and nighttime. The only time where uh, time, uh, where the time feature becomes a bother is when you spy on Lewis. You have to be uh, at a specific time, which is close to when Lewis is in the house, but it can't be while Lewis is in the house. So 5 o'clock and 11 o'clock are both times that work, but I remember getting badly stuck on the puzzle the first time around. So, Lewis Chandler, the antique dealer who never handles antiques. He's an incredibly dull older man, and uh, half the time he, he's half mumbling when he's talking. I didn't like Lewis, but it seems like he's purposely dull and unlikable because he's the culprit. I think I prefer the book version of Lewis, who doubles, who's more handsome, and he doubles as Rose's love interest. Here, he's just the boring guy who's using the library. It's like Nigel in Curse of Blackmore Manor. After you talk to Lewis, you go to Abby for a seance, and this is easily my favorite part of the game. It's a scary scene with a ghost woman, and the neat part is that the hauntings continue throughout the entire game. All over the place, Nancy hears weird noises, she sees strange shadows. It's definitely spooky, and it makes you feel like you are in a haunted mansion. The cool part is that some of the hauntings are subtle, uh, like the painting that winks at you and the moving phoenix. When you notice them, you wonder if it really happened or it's your imagination playing tricks on you. The fact that the hauntings occur semi-randomly only adds to their unexpected nature. It's great, it's scary, pretty much everybody loves the hauntings in this game. After the seance is when most players find their way into the attic, which is also a creepy place. It's a dusty, abandoned place that hasn't been used in decades. Looking around the room is neat, and it's somewhat scary that the exit door breaks, even if Nancy easily repairs the exit door with the crowbar in the room. I did not like the puzzle in the attic, which is inside the desk drawer. You have to use the paint scraper on the bedpost in Nancy's room to get the key for the desk drawer. That gives you a piece of music with, with five notes that are darkened. Uh, it's not obvious that the notes are darkened, because it's a dark area in general, and the paper is kind of stained, so it, it's easy to miss that. It's You're supposed to uh, play those notes on the piano here downstairs, which gives you a paper with holes, then you go back upstairs to the attic and, and, and use it there on the sheet music, which, which gives you uh, the coded message, Find Diego on the stairs. Going from the attic to the basement, back to the attic again, it, it's not that bad, uh, but if I designed the puzzle, I probably would have cut out the second attic trip. Diego on the stairs refers, refers to the stop the top of the staircase. There, there are letters uh, on the supports. You spin them around to change what letters appear. You need to spell out Diego, and that gives you a hidden letter from Diego, which I can't read. I can't read the letter. The idea is that, you know, he left a hidden treasure for his wife to find, and now Nancy's gonna find that hidden treasure. I probably should mention Diego Valdez and his wife, Lizzie Applegate. Throughout the game, there are random mentions of them. Diego, Diego is mentioned... 
Diego is mentioned in Charlie's term paper. Lizzie's mentioned in a book in the library. You can have conversations about them with the with the various characters. Lizzie and Diego, they, they used to own the house. Uh, let's see. Uh, Diego was a bank robbing bandit and uh, that, that she she was kind of a headstrong woman who ran her own acting society and that's pretty much all the information we get about them it's kind of a sweet love story though i liked it about the headstrong woman who tamed the wild rebel it, it was nice also in the attic is an iron which you can use to fix the dumb waiter that is rose's third job for nancy she doesn't have any other jobs for nancy to do and it seems kind of silly to bring nancy all the way out to california just to do three things but rose is silly like that fixing the dumb waiter gives you a tile if you get all three tiles you can put them in the fireplace in the library to open a hidden passageway that lets you spy on lewis nancy watches him hide a book in his briefcase which is actually two puzzles First is the maze puzzle on Lewis's computer, which is not a fun puzzle. It's long, it's hard to find the right pathways, and it's too easy to run up against invisible walls where it looks like you should be able to go forward, but you can't. The good news is that there's a cheat for the puzzle. Just press the M button to make a map appear. I am so glad the cheat is available, because it makes the maze puzzle less tedious and more playable. I feel like the map puzzle was just a tech demo. Somebody was playing around with doing a 3D maze, and then they just slipped it into the game afterwards. Solving the maze puzzle lets you log on to Lewis's computer. Again, not logical, doesn't make sense. His computer is locked with a password. Why does a maze puzzle bypass the password? It's not like there's a clue or something which indicates that's a correct way to get onto the computer either. On the computer, Lewis has a code for his briefcase, so now you can open his briefcase and you, you can look at several things inside. The challenge, that challenge, uh, looking through Lewis's briefcase, is on a timer, which I thought was unfair. I wanted to snoop into his briefcase and, and look at everything, but when I tried that, I got a game over sequence. So you kind of have to ignore one to two, one to two to three things in the briefcase while you're snooping around in there, otherwise you run out of time. The book that Lewis hid has the phrase Gumbo Foo in it, so Nancy needs to ask everybody about Gumbo Foo, which is not really all that important. Gumbo Foo means Gold Treasure Mansion, which means there's gold in the house. We already knew that. We found the letter from Diego. But still, uh, Nancy needs to ask everyone about Gumbo Foo. It's a somewhat tedious challenge, especially because nobody knows about it. Lewis does. There's a game over sequence if you admit you got the phrase from a book, but, you know, he lies about what gumbo means. The only person who, who can actually help you with the gumbo foo challenge is Emily Foxworthy. Emily is Nancy's phone contact in this game, and she doesn't get introduced at any point. You're just supposed to know who she is ahead of time. She's an un She's an upbeat reporter from San Francisco. She's pretty helpful. Uh, occasionally, she's funny. Definitely the best phone contact of the game. The other phone contacts are Bess and George. Having both of them together is going to be standard from here on out. George sounds like she's super excited to be in a Nancy Drew game, whereas Bess just sounds like, she, you know, she sounds like she just woke up from a nap. You can also call Hannah Gruen, who's only mildly interesting. She more or less disappears from the series after this. Sometimes you hear her on the Drew family answering machine. If you call Nancy's house, that's it. I wish they had done. I, I wish they had done more with Hannah, since this is her only appearance. A few other things happen around this point in the game. Uh, the game is less linear than the others, meaning you can do things in pretty much whatever order, whatever order you want, with some minor exceptions. I like that. It gives the game a sense of open-endedness, and the series will more or less continue with non-linear gameplay from here on out. Both the uh, Charlie and Abby investigations can be wrapped up at, at this point in the game around here. With Abby, you can look under the seance table. Uh, you find a tape in a fog machine, which proves the entire seance is a fake. If you sneak around in Abby's room, you find a bunch of complicated equipment, which she used in order to fake all the hauntings in the house. So it's not really a haunted house. Abby was just trying to make it seem that way in order to drum up publicity. That's a fine explanation for all the scary scenes in the game. Much better than, say, Nancy was unknowingly on hallucinogenic drugs the entire time. Looking at you, Thornton Hall. You can't talk to Abby or Rose about the hauntings, though. Nancy keeps it a secret for some reason. Uh, that seems unfair. Like, I wanted to confront Abby with the truth about the hauntings. You can get her to confess that the seance was fake, but she, she won't talk about any of the other stuff. 
Speaking of dropped plot points, Charlie's living in the basement! You can't learn this until after you spy on Lewis. Turns out that there's a secret passageway from the fireplace uh, to the backside of the saloon. Charlie sleeps there, and he sees everything that happens in the basement through a one-way mirror. That is way creepier than the game makes it out to be. When Nancy confronts him, he says he'll tell Rose eventually. Maybe, probably not, and the issue never gets addressed again. Nancy gets a message, uh, not a message, she gets a, well, she does get a message, it's it's more of a letter, letter, me okay, I'm babbling, sorry about that, Nancy gets a letter from the culprit, which is the titular message in a haunted mansion, the message says, leave the mansion now, which is kind of, kind of, kind of scary and, and ominous, uh, more frightening is the fact that the letter triggers, triggers a fire, inside the parlor. Nancy needs to put out the fire with a fire extinguisher or else it's game over. I like this challenge, but I didn't like how you get an automatic game over if you click on the fire. I mean, come on, the fire's a hot spot you can click on and you're not supposed to click on it? That doesn't seem fair. After the fire, or before the fire, if you did things in a particular order, everybody in the mansion leaves to go to the Winter Festival. I'd be more offended about them not inviting Nancy if I knew what the Winter Festival was. Uh, this is the only time in the game that it gets mentioned. In the book, it's an old-timey festival. All the characters dress up in fancy costumes. Nancy's costume has a hat. She, she has a fancy little hat. So she has those old-fashioned hat pins, which she uses at the end of the book to disable the culprit. Uh, that was kind of silly, Stop stopping the culprit with hat pins, and I I'm glad they changed the culprit capture for the game. Anyway, everybody leaves the house at the same time towards the end of the game, and at this point, Nancy gets a letter from Emily about Gumbo Fu, which, as I said, is not very important. Also, Rose moves the tapestry in Nancy's room, so now Nancy can so solve a series of Chinese puzzles. I feel slightly cheated that the endgame game sequence is more of a random coincidence than the result of Nancy being a good detective. I mean, if Rose hadn't moved the tapestry for no real reason, Nancy would have been stuck. She would never have solved the mystery. So, Chinese puzzles. The first one is okay. You click on the 12 zodiac animals in the order they appear in a book in Abby's room. The second puzzle is not okay. It forces you to select 10 Chinese symbols in a specific order, and it pretty much requires you to know the solution ahead of time. Because unless you were taking notes on a separate piece of paper, you are forced to backtrack through every screen of the entire game. As no fun whatsoever. The game needs to warn players about this puzzle in advance. It would have made a big difference if Nancy said, I should keep track of every Chinese symbol I see. It also would have helped if Nancy kept a copy of every symbol in her notebook. She has a notebook in this game! Yes, it's pretty much useless and easily overlooked. All, all, all Nancy does is jot down random notes about the characters, like Louis knows antiques and Gumbo Fu? It doesn't help you keep track of important information. Solving the Chinese puzzles opens a safe, where you find Diego and Lizzie's marriage certificate and some letters. There's another puzzle box, where, where you solve a sun, and, a sun puzzle and a slider puzzle. They were fine puzzles, although the slider puzzle was a little difficult. It's not obvious at first glance what the picture is supposed to look like. If you go back to the library to check what the picture looks like, because that, that's where the picture is, all of those puzzles reset, which is a huge pain. Oh, that, that should not have happened. Uh, the slider puzzle gives you a gem. Using the gem on the banister on the stairs reveals that the golden treasure is buried underneath the main floor of the building. At this point, Lewis reveals himself as the culprit. He, he knocks Nancy out and starts stuffing the gold into his bag. The ending scene will explain that Lewis's evil plot was to fake a bunch of accidents, so Rose would despair of restoring the building and sell it to him for cheap. That way, he could search for treasure in the mansion without interference. This plot didn't make sense in the book, and it doesn't make sense here. He already had free reign of the mansion, so why does he feel like he needs to buy it? When did he learn that there was gold gold in the mansion anyway? Like, like the accident started long before Nancy saw him discover Gumbo Fu in the book. Nancy needs to stop Lewis here at the ending scene, and her inventory has just disappeared, so she can't hit him with a crowbar. Instead, she goes up the staircase, and she drops a chandelier on his head. 
a somewhat violent solution, but amazingly, Lewis survives without any injuries. Uh, the puzzle isn't that difficult, because the chandelier is the only thing in this area that you can interact with. The tricky part is knowing which staircase to use to reach the chandelier, because if you use the wrong staircase, uh, the staircase here, it, it creaks and alerts Lewis to your presence. I don't know. If this was real life, I think Nancy would have been able to tackle Lewis from behind and disarm him. He doesn't appear to have any weapons at all, and he's an older man who's not expecting an ambush. Nancy totally would have won that fight. The treasure is given to a bank, which is kind of boring, but the bank gives Abby and Rose enough money to renovate the house and start a successful business. As for the male characters, we never learn what happened to them. The end. Uh, before I finish, let's talk about the difficulty settings. The game has two difficulty settings, not three like the two previous games. I think it was a good idea to cut back to two difficulty settings, since the difficulty settings don't make that much of a difference. They only affect the ending puzzle and the Diego puzzle on the stairs. Overall, this is a good game, the highlight being the great atmosphere. It's somewhat simplistic and it's short, but it's a definite improvement over the two previous games. This is the first game that I would freely recommend to a Nancy Drew newcomer, although I would warn them about that final puzzle being, being very difficult. So I give Nancy Drew, number three, Message in a Haunted Mansion, a 9 out of 10, uh, taking off a point for uh, that difficult ending puzzle and and the the tile puzzle so basically just those difficult puzzles i'm taking off points for i'm taking off a point for those puzzles